Mike Green, I'm here in Las Vegas at the Win. We're here for EQ Derivatives Conference. And I've got Chris and Harley. This is a reprise of an interview that we did, guys, I mean, believe it or not, four years ago, five years ago now, it feels yeah. like. Um, first, it's fantastic to have everybody back in, in person. I mean, we're in a phenomenal suite here right now, but the, the, the ability to sit down with many of our peers in person for the first time in about three or four years has been really great. And what I was hoping to get you guys to chat about is some of the stuff that we were chatting briefly on the panel yesterday, but like what in the world is actually going on in the volatility space? Because we're struggling with hedging dynamics in this environment. I know you're struggling with it as well. This feels radically different than anything that we have seen in a while. Chris, I, the, only cl the closest analogy I can draw is to the fourth quarter of 2018 in terms of the way the markets feel like they're behaving, where you're just not getting that you know, cleansing plunge from, you know, a VIX spike sort of thing. It feels like something sitting out there supplying vault to the market. Any thoughts? Yeah, I think there's, uh, it, it's pretty interesting because I think if you look at it, uh, just this past month, for example, um, you had a situation where you had a down 4% day in the equity market and down 1% day. And if you looked at fixed strike vols, which are, you know, the vols of the S&P 500 by strike price, they were actually down week mm -hmm. over week. So if you had told me that you have two days like that and fixed rate vols would be down, that, that, that's actually quite shocking. But it has happened before in, in different periods in market history. Um, and I think one of the things is there's a couple, there's not one factor in my view that's driving that necessarily, the underperformance of equity vol. It's been very frustrating because clients invest in vol and then you're not getting a payout in equity vol. You're getting a payout in commodity vol, you're getting a payout in currency vol and rate vol, but you're not getting the payout in equity vol. Um, one aspect of that is simply this concept that the market has been hedged. People came in with a lot of hedges coming into this year. 100%. And so one of the things that's really uh, interesting, um, you know, I have a, uh, or you look at a house that you might buy in Miami on the water, and you've got to uh, insure that against a hurricane. Um, okay, so you buy hurricane insurance, and the fact that you own hurricane insurance does not affect the probability of a hurricane. But the truth is that it doesn't work that way in financial markets. When people buy more insurance, it actually reduces the probability of the event happening based on the dealer flows and the monetization of, that, of, of those hedges. What's most interesting about this is that the biggest risk to markets usually occurs after that first drop when everyone has monetized their insurance. That's when the market is most exposed. That's when the hurricane can punch back in the biggest way. And generally, you'll see that first move down in markets. And then when, there, when everyone monetizes, when there is that, if, if there happens to be another systemic leg that causes um, some sort of solvency event, then you have that second big leg down. So an analogy to this, I actually think is interesting, is about 2007. Okay. In 2007, and I'm not necessarily saying that we're going to get an yeah, OA collapse, but I'm, I'm using this as kind of a, a, an analogy. In 2007, the market dropped 20% from the end of 2007 to July 2008. Mm -hmm. At that point, people were tired of hedging, and the VIX over that period of time just fluctuated between 20 to 30. At that point, you then had the solvency crisis that occurred in the banking system, right when everyone was not predominantly hedged or had monetized most of their hedges. And that led that second major leg down. And there was incredible vol persistence at that point. And we'll talk more about that later. I want to give Harley a chance to speak a little bit here. So well, before before we do that, Harley, I, I, one of these things that is actually interesting in how deeply you've gotten inflation wrong is <laughs> um, is that you groveling trying to go and change history mid sentence? All. Not at all. So your, your inflation product has, has not done gotten it wrong. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> I cannot play. talk about tickers, guys. Okay, want to yeah. talk about about, about your inflation that. call <laughs> for transitory. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, last November. So in the those guys, that, like life is transitory, right? Yes, exactly. No, I was very specific. I said the end of 22, but we'll see how it plays out. So 
The, the, the point that I would actually make, though, is during that period, exactly at that point, is when we begin to encounter forces very similar to what we're seeing right now, which is this bizarre confluence of rising commodity prices and an economy that is clearly slowing, right? I mean, it was very obvious to everybody in 2007, we had already seen the housing market roll over, which accounts for a disproportionate uh, fraction of economic activity in one form or another. And unemployment was already rising in that environment. The drag, I, I still remember I was at Canyon Partners and one of my colleagues, um, Josh Donfeld, wrote a, a piece internally highlighting the tax that was being extracted on consumers from the extraordinary increase in oil prices that we were seeing. And he 100% nailed it. And at that point, it was like, wait a second, this is completely obvious. Everybody's about to fall apart, right? But exactly to Chris's point, that was basically a pause. And then we rallied in just a, an exhausting way. It feels like something like that could very well be in play right now. I, I, before I get to the, the question of inflation, let's go and I want to push back a bit on, on Chris's notion here of, of overhedged, underhedged. Um, in the exchange option market, which is what you're talking about, it's a closed system. You're buying it from someone else. So the vol is in the system. Now, a, a, an example of, of being outside the system is when the Fed bought X gazillion mortgages. So, and the Fed doesn't hedge, so therefore they effectively sold X, um, you know, hundreds of billions of two-year, three-year options on 10-year rate and depressed volatility. But to the extent that retail is buying it from, you know, Susquehanna or Citadel, you know, what they're kind of saying theoretically is that Citadel is a much better hedger than retail, and therefore there is a net gamma in the, in the, in the trade. But I'm not quite convinced of that. Like the, the pundits that put out these these charts every day about the gamma exposure on the street, that's that's just someone who's getting paid a salary to go and fill space every day. Okay, because I can assure you, Susquehanna and Citadel and everyone else, the big market makers, they're delta hedging along the way. They're just doing it in a much more smooth, systematic, algorithmic way, as opposed to a retail trader or probably some hedge fund trader, truth be told, who's going to go hit the panic button at the bottom and, and dump out his delta. So I, I, I'm not a big buyer of this idea um, that, 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 that the location matters that much. I'm, I'm, I'm more interested in the level of vol being the driver because the level of vol actually matters. The higher the vol, sorry to get geeky in everybody here, the higher the vol, the lower the gamma, and therefore the less sensitivity to market movements. So in that sense, when you have very high vols, that kind of you know will reduce the market. Lower at the money gamma, but yeah, but side gamma increased. But you know, Harley, it's the, interesting because the gamma is lower no matter what. I, I do agree. I do agree with you on this. I, I do think, like especially in the derivatives community, there's been so much. And boy, like God forbid you say this on Twitter, you'll get your head ripped off. So I'm like terrified to even say it here. But you know the the framework being at the end of the day that. Uh, there's so much talk about dealer positioning, and I almost think a myopic view that that's the only thing that drives option option markets and markets themselves. I think that dealer positioning, which is what we're talking about, is you know the negative gamma, the vanna exposure, the skew. That that element is part of the interesting mosaic of markets, and it does have, I believe, a temporary impact on the liquidity. But I think the myopic view on that is Do that- Do you think dealers are dumber than retail? Well, no, I, I, I think that- think they're, 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 they're dumber playing. than hedge funds? At, no. a certain, at a certain point, there, needs, there is a fundamental reality that comes into play, which you know, one aspect is liquidity. And some people say that, hey, equity vol is only liquidity. I disagree. And the dealer, the, the dynamics ex, uh, looking at dealer exposures are measuring to some degree liquidity. But what, what I think the, my, the, the thing that that myopic view doesn't recognize is the fact that, hey, there is a real world and credit solvency is the other component of this. And the Federal Reserve interacts in that. There is a fundamental aspect. And that it's the combination of illiquidity and air gaps combined with insolvency is what causes sustained vol. And that, I, that is the missing component that I think that people see in this uh, that don't always put it together. I think a lot of the times when people come from purely a derivatives world, you guys, you guys see the ent entire picture, they, it's like hammer to nail. 
There's not that there's not that framework that is like if you're a hammer, everything's a nail. But there's a bigger world out there. And you know, hey, when when the um, when the Federal Reserve quite possibly illegally um, creates a uh, a bid for high yield bonds. Yeah. yeah, creates a bid for high yield bonds outside of its mandate, which is inherently a, a short volatility play. You know, that has a fundamental impact that overrides anything. Who's going to go through the Fed? <laughs> Ain't the DOJ, okay? <laughs> the Bitcoiners. Bitcoiners are going to sue the Fed. I, no, I think the um, dirty secret here really is what's your risk limit? That's the key. What's your risk limit? And I would suspect that uh, a Citadel or Susquehanna have a different risk limit uh, than a hedge fund does, and a Wall Street firm has a different risk limit. That, so certainly, there are hedge funds out there, certain ones out there, we know who they are, where they're individual pods, and they have very tight stops, and you hit that stop, and you're fired, uh, that's going to make you do something well before someone else has a longer-term yeah. business horizon. So that's the guy you care about. And, 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 and you, know, you know, Michael, you're always talking about passive investing, and when will that, you know, nut turn and become net sellers versus net buyers? Well, we don't know when that number is, but there's a risk, there's a risk limit, a stop for, for even them. What, and and have, we, have we gotten there? Uh, maybe, maybe not, probably not. Um, but I, I, I think you got to recognize that. I, I, I think trying to go pick out the strikes of the logs and short stars is kind of, you know, a fool's errand. So. Well, I, so there is a very mechanical aspect to, to what Chris is highlighting, right? Which is that there is the dealer community. The dealer community is a net creator of options. So in the same way that you're describing... Both ways. Uh, much less so on the on on this. They they are net sellers of options, which means they have to synthetically create it through delta hedging, right? They are always going to be net short options because the ability to actually match on on an exchange when you have the single stock dynamics. For you example, sure? Kind of think I kind of think of the net buyers of short date options. That's why you have the term surface uh, going down so hard. Is because you have the large systematic funds selling one month vol every day, day in day out. That's why you have the, the term slope. One day vol now. If, 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 if the street was a net seller of vol, the term surface would be, would, be, would be the opposite direction. Right? I don't think that's... Uh, so I, I don't I think, think you have one month sellers of vol from the systematic hedge funds who you know who they are, and you have systematic buyers of vol in the six month and one year space being the guys who have to buy it like insurance companies. And that's why you get this term slope going down. So there's various products that are trying to reap and capture that fundamental uh, te technical roll down. Um, that you have. It's a, it's a very steep roll down, and that's from you have massive selling of one month, massive buying of six months and one year. It's, it's flattened considerably. It's just, well, it flattens because, because you, you end up we're gonna get really geeky over here. It flattens because the, the, the forward always has to go to you know, 20, which is the long term you know, VIX number. So, if, I mean, the, for, for, the forwards will, will, will invariably point towards the long term average of something. Uh, if it's a mean reverting process, which which vol is, I mean, but no that's one of the things bar. we've actually seen, and this goes back to you know the change in tone that's occurred since 2018. I actually was just having a conversation with institutional shareholder services about this, and if you look at the implied one month correlation, for example, it's gone from six and change in 2017, and a you know variance contract to your point, Harley, of the 20 and the forwards, a one year variance forward in 2017 would have cost you 17 and a half. Right, so 17.5% implied volatility going forward. Today, that number, I think, is 29. Yeah, but you had 17, you had a VIX of 12. So the forward was, the forward was pointing up towards 20. Right, and, so. to, and today, to Chris's point, we actually have an inverted surface where spot today, I think, is 28, and the forward is maybe 28, 29, almost perfectly flat. If I go back a week ago, it was 35 versus 29, right? I, 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 and on top of that, the correlation between SPX and... And, and uh, Vol has broken down considerably. I think you know, everyone's break. circling around the big concept. You know, everyone keeps asking all of us, why is the move way so high? The move is the VIX for bonds and versus the, move, the, the, the VIX, which is, you know, relatively low in the context of what's going on. And the answer is short dated options, one month, two month options on highly liquid risk instruments, stocks, bonds, FX, commodities, tends to trade 8 to 12% over-realized forever. And that's why you have these systematic hedge funds coming in and selling one-month vol and delta hedging either at 2 o'clock or 4 o'clock, wherever it might be. And we have not been moving that much. Realized vol is really not that great relative to a 20% down move uh, on stocks. Um, yeah, but vol is still trading at a, at a pretty big discount to it. And, um, I mean, God, you look at Volavol, which is Volavol is trading at a 60-point discount. 
you know, to, you know, to uh, implied vol balls trading at a 60 point discount to realize. But you know, this gets sort of another concept, which I, I don't think is like, I mean, there's so much talk about positioning and, and all these other aspects, but the impact of stagflation on vol itself. And, you know, when you do like a vol fit model, you know, the, there's all this academic literature, you know, as you guys well know, the gas vol stuff, and you got, you got the jump factor, but then there's like a and correlation between vol and all this, all this complexity. But one of the things that people forget about is the persistence of vol. And the uh, vol persistence versus vol jump. And these are two very, very different things. And if you go back into the 19, if you go back to 2008, where VIX stayed over uh, over 30 for what was I think almost nine months, I think or seven to nine months, um, versus what happened in March of 2020, where it stayed above 30 for like a month and a half. If you go back to the 1970s during that stagflationary era. We don't have implied vol, but you can look at realized volatility. Realized volatility stayed elevated for a long period of time, but you didn't get these super spikes. Mm -hmm. So I think I think the framework, which is really interesting, if, if we take a step back and not look at it from a technical standpoint, but just from a macro standpoint, inflation um, and, and stagflation can suppress realized volatility on a because on you're looking at the dynamic of nominal to real, and it's actually serving as a volatility suppressant in equities. That volatility is transmogrified to things like commodities and to things like gold and to rates. But the other aspect is in a stagflationary environment, you don't have the Fed reaction function. So naturally, what's going to occur is that you're going to have not as many super spikes but there's not going to be the fast mean reversion. You have lower vol jump factor and higher vol persistence. And I find it interesting, it's, it's too early to sit back and say you know, whether or not this is a sea change right now. But it's interesting that as we are now in a negative real rate stagflationary type of environment, at least for the time being, we are seeing that 70s style persistence of vol without the super spikes emerge. If that's true, then that means an entire generation of vol models are miscalibrated, <laughs> which is really interesting. Unless we go back to a deflationary shock. And I know we talked a lot about that on the panel yesterday. Yeah. yesterday. Well, this is so this is one of the things. So a, cu a couple of points that I would, would make very quickly. One is um, at least when I look at the realized volatility, we absolutely are seeing it at, at relatively high levels. Um, relative to a 20% drawdown or an official bear market, probably not, but we actually haven't had the recession yet either, right? Which yeah. is typically what, it, what accompanies that. And so there's a lot of uncertainty around the individual. The other thing, and I think this hits to the stagflation, right? So as, as you know, I'm a longtime critic of the idea that the 1970s were stagflation for the very simple reason that there was no stag. Right, like there was inflation, but there was no stagnation. The economy actually grew remarkably well. We had multiple recessions during the decade, and yet we still created more jobs in the 1970s than we ever have in the U.S. history. Right, so like the ability to disregard that and call the the economy stagnant just feels completely absurd to me. Right, this time around we may actually have stagflation. Right, where the uncertainties associated with the supply chains create the need to continually reinvest and change those supply chains in ways that have unpredictable relationship to costs at the same time that the economy itself is growing much more slowly, right? The labor force growth is dramatically reduced. The, there is no impact of women entering the labor force for the first time in size, et cetera, right? We're just not seeing those elements kick in. So I, I, I agree with you. The other thing that I would highlight about the inflation dynamic, though, is, is that particularly when you have a period like the 1970s where there was really extraordinary amounts of growth, you didn't have, and it was widespread, right? Because it was, everybody needed the commodities, everybody, the housing starts were near the highest levels in history. I mean, crazily enough, housing starts were higher then, right? With half the population than we have today, right? I mean, that's like, 
if nothing else blows people mind, like, you know, come on. Like, that's a huge deal that we had more housing starts in the 1970s than we had today. Better demographics. Dramatically yeah. better demographics, right? Um, so when, when we think through that dynamic, one of the things I would highlight with inflation is, is that there's this idea that inflation is this monolithic entity, right? That it's, you know, well, we've got inflation, right? Well, that means something different if it's isolated in lumber or if it's isolated in energy or if it's, you know, isolated in different things versus a very broad pattern. And I would just highlight that along that spectrum, you can, this time around, we could very easily have companies fail and we're seeing this. Right. We're beginning to see the first emergences of bankruptcies as companies that have bankruptcies shutting down, you know, um, uh, for labor force reductions, et cetera. As companies are coming to the reality of like, well, the hyper stimulation that we received 18 months ago is gone and we're low on the consumer's discretionary budget. Right. Peloton, for example. Right. Um, nobody needs one anymore. And there's plenty of used ones out there. Right. Um, so you end up in this situation where a very wide range of outcomes can occur, whereas in a broad growth environment like the 1970s, I think I agree with that. But what we haven't seen until very recently, and I think this is part of the reason we've had such a disconnect, is there's been a hidden bear market, right? So, you know, absolutely we have seen, you know, the, the pandemic and the venture, cap, you know, the pseudo venture capital, the you know, late stage growth companies that went public through SPACs, et cetera. Those have just been unmitigated disasters. The venture capital index is down 60%, for example, right? Arc so is back to its pre-pandemic. Arc, Arc, Arc is now underperforming the S&P, not even on an asset weighted basis, but in absolute terms, right? Exactly. And so, you know, you have these characteristics that are suggesting that this bear market was much worse than the headline would actually suggest. And if you look at those individual stocks and you look at the individual volatilities, I would suggest that they were they they were very very they they, they are indicating much more distress. Yeah. Um, but and it's just not an there. Apple and Microsoft and everything else. And yes, they're down. Yes, we potentially should really be paying attention to them because that could very easily be the next. So leg. you're describing that the economy has become an oligopoly. Well, it's it, you know so Peter Atwater has the phrase the the, the K shaped recovery right, which is basically it goes off in two different directions, and it does feel that there is an element of have and have nots that exists right now, right? And we've seen, you know, retailer inventories are now well above the pre-pandemic levels. We've quote unquote solved that. The problem is they don't have what people necessarily want. People want to show up for groceries at this point. Yeah. You know, you're hearing this from Walmart and Target, that people want to show up for groceries and they have, you know, decorative cushions, right? Which so you're saying the, that the stock market is already priced in a recession, theoretically. I, um, I think it's very hard to know what we've priced in. And if your Spruce 490 is down, whatever it is, 30%, and the rest are down 10, then it's what the buy Well, we're, we're, we're on the opposite side, right? I mean, if you actually look at the breadth indicators, the breadth indicators started to turn negative in late 2020 and became extraordinarily extreme as we looked at the start of this year, right? It wasn't until January, basically, very beginning of January 2022, that you started to see the leaders taken out and shot. Right. I mean, Apple was fine. Microsoft was fine. And now they're not. And that's really what we're seeing make up the indices in this bear market that we're experiencing now that it's making through. But if you were an investor in ARC or you were an investor in, you know, a Tiger Cub or anyone else who has ironically followed through that. No, I'm actually surprised, by the way, that nobody has kind of focused on this dynamic of Tiger shutting down in March of 2000 because they were locked into value and now blowing up on the other side because they became momentum growth investors. It's, it's pretty, it's, it's pretty shocking. Actually. It is pretty shocking. It's um, interesting how little is made about, you know, you hear so much in the VC community about innovation, innovation, innovation. And I mean, maybe, I guess I, maybe I'm silly, but I, I just, I just look at tech as an interest rate play. It's sort of like, okay, you know, at 0% rates, you can blitz scale something to infinity and maybe that's the way to, you know, that's where value is. But at, you know, at a, at a higher interest rate, why would I, why would I sit there and finance something um, at that level? And like, it, to me, it should move in accordance with rates. Well, all the FANG stocks are basically 70 year bonds. I mean, we know that Amazon will make a yeah. trillion dollars in 30 years. Well, the question is, what's the discount to bring that trillion dollars back that's, to today? That's a much more eloquent way of 
I was trying to get that out of my system, but I, it was much more elegant. So, so, so this is actually an area though that I think I may pretty strongly disagree with you guys on, right? So, I, like, I understand the theory of what Harley is saying, but it's but tech stocks are not actually thirty-year bonds right, or seventy-year bonds. We don't actually know what cash is going to be returned to us in Amazon in thirty years. The company didn't exist thirty years ago, right? Just outside of that. And now we're looking at a situation where, yes, it feels like it's absolutely certain that Amazon's going to be there, but I, I can paint a picture that says Amazon's replaced, right? There's no reason Amazon has to be sitting there. And so you have to have that inherent uncertainty, right? I mean, equities have a cone of possibilities that expands ad infinitum. The point of maximum uncertainty is always where you sell it, right? Whereas bonds are very, very different. They effectively look like, and I always have to specify this for international audiences, but they look like an American football, right? A high quality bond effectively converges at par at maturity, right? So, and, and we see like if you own a bond fund, it has different characteristics, but if you own individual bonds, as long as the credit's okay, you know what that's worth. No, but the, all stocks have, have the EPS and then the discount factor, the PE. Um, it's just the FANG stocks is, is, is much more backloaded. So they're more impacted by rate, right? I, see, I don't think that's right, though. I mean, a, a FANG stock is more like a zero coupon bond where you get paid at the very end as opposed to a cash flow along the way. But the stocks that you're talking about, right? And so the, I, I, I agree with that to characterize they the They performed that way, haven't they? Not really. Not really? I kind of think so. Although it's, what's interesting about it, they, I mean, they have performed that way recently. Yeah. But actually, if you, if you look at it in the 90s, that was actually... The, oh, no, no, they, they, weren't, they weren't the same companies. But, the same but, companies but even, yeah. you don't even have to go back that far. If you look at them from 2015 to 2019, right? Rates rose and they outperformed. So uh, I'm just talking recently, in the last five years, three years, you know, with the Fed having taken rates down to zero, then kind of back up again. I think, I think another interesting spin, though, is that, you know, we're all, uh, Michael, we're all always talking about, about the correlation of stocks to bonds. Yeah. And if, if um, there's a lot of, I won't say regional, I'll say, I'll say very good looking charts that indicate a correlation where if inflation gets above two and a half or, or rates above four and a half, I'm talking long rates now, that the correlation of stocks to bond flips. And, and the question I really have is, is it the inflation? Or is it the rate that matters? Because what I'm thinking about right now is, because I feel very comfortable if something gets to, you know, above those levels, you'll see stocks and bonds go down together, like they did March 2020 or December 18. Um, and it'll be, you know, financial Armageddon. Well, 60-40 goes, goes into the tank and risk parity goes to negative. Well, I mean, we've seen that. Like but the, year what happens, what if I give you this as an example, that we have inflation at six, Okay, and we have bonds at three. Does the correlation follow the, the inflation number or the rate number? And I'm thinking more and more that maybe the answer is the rate number, not inflation, because PE should be driven by you know, a, a, a discounted cash flow. We discount them at, at rates, not at inflation. As a matter of fact, a, a, a rate of three and inflation of six, I find is pretty darn bullish for bonds, for, for, for stocks. Because EPS goes up because, by definition, if you have inflation of six, you're raising prices. So therefore, nominal earnings go up. You're discounting them at a low rate. That's, that's stock bullish, isn't it? And that means this correlation idea is out the window of, of, of being fearful. You know, Harley, it's interesting because, uh, you know, I, um, and, I mean, it's a, you bring up a really fascinating point. Uh, in 2015, I wrote this paper that was kind of a long-winded paper. But I, I looked at these relationships going back, um, God, 100 years. And the thing that I really found that drove the correlation breakdown was actually uh, the volatility of inflation. Not inflation, but the volatility of inflation. And if you saw, if you, whenever, when you just measure the statistical ball of inflation where it's moving up or down to any degree, just moving a, a lot, you see that correlation breakdown his, historically over 100 years. And it's, it's kind of a, I think there's a chart in that paper a long time ago, but it's kind of shocking. But um, that's just empirical. I mean, I, I, I try to think yeah, through what you're saying. But, but, so since, since inflation really can't be negative, maybe in theory it could sometimes, but it means you only get high vol when you get high inflation because it's got to move. I mean, it has to go up, this has to go back down again. So yeah. it's kind of like the same thing. High inflation and high volatility go together. Well, you can have deflationary big shocks, especially when... Yeah, but you're stuff. coming from a high to it back to, back to <laughs> low. You're not yeah. going negative, you know. So by definition, you can only get vol when it's, when it's high. Yeah. Um, but I, I, I've been, you know... 
really concerned because I, I, I've weaved together a story of investing of how it should go, and, 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 and you know, Mike and I have chatted back and forth about inflation. He's crying his eyes out now, um, as long as two other of our guests. Um, but maybe being right on inflation is actually meaningless to the investment process if rates don't go with it. And in the past, we've, all the charts we've seen, you see inflation and rates kind of go together, but this time they're breaking apart. And as a public policy concept, negative real rates are great. The Fed would love the idea of high inflation to devalue the debt we have, the nominal debt we have, and then have negative real rates as an economic impulse to, you know, to feed the machine, to feed growth and investment. I mean, a negative three strikes me as being the, the Fed's ideal scenario. I mean, ironically, ironically- Negative three real, sorry, negative three real. Yeah, I, I mean, ironically, the real world is measured by inflation. But our, I mean, we go back to the concept of, of, of a tech stock being a zero coupon bond, whether one believes it or not, what we do know is the discount rate is the rate. It's, it's the interest rate, not the inflation rate. The yeah. I mean, yeah. does Mike, does, does a negative three real for the next three years, does that bother you? I mean, does that, that accentuate any of your ideas? No, I, I mean, that actually feels to me like the likely outcome of what we're experiencing, right? So, like, to me, I don't think that the, le you, you know, you've shared charts from Gerald Manack and others that highlight this idea that if, you know, the level of rates or if level of inflation gets to four and a half, that X, Y, Z flips, Right. I don't think that's, I don't agree with that. One, because I think that there's just a huge data issue, right? We basically have one data series that shows inflation going up into the 1970s and then coming down, and now we have another spike, and so we naturally take that spike and project it back onto the other. I don't think that necessarily has to be true at all. I think you bring up the important point, which is, I would argue it's actually the Fed's reaction function, right? So if the Fed feels bound by the inflation, as they now do, having adopted the term um, transitory and not specified what they meant by transitory, right? So we kind of knew what they meant by transitory. Man. I don't think I don't think we have any idea because they did not actually tell us, right? I think what actually is is part of the challenge is, is that people hear transitory and they're like, okay, so next week, right? It's going to retreat next week. That's just not a realistic appraisal of it, but it got to the point where the Fed had to abandon that for political reasons. It just wasn't acceptable, right? To sit well, there. Well, that wasn't and, true. Again, if you define transitory as there's a two-year in you know flux, then that tells you something. If by the end of 2022 we don't see a return to sub three percent inflation, I'll be wrong, right? Uh, I, th I think the common parlance was in September, October, November of last year. Transitory meant March, April of this year. That's what everyone thought it meant. Now maybe you didn't mean that when you said it, and all our guests didn't mean when they said it. But that was the idea of transitory. It wasn't. Three years from now, I, I, I always I always define transitory as we have no idea what we're doing and we're just making this up as we go along. <laughs> that's well, kind of like that's how I've looked at that word as the, the way they've used it. So. Well, it, it it does feel that way, right? Because they've effectively taken the adage of you know a stop clock is right twice a day, and they've unfortunately looked at the clock and like oh my god it's six hours behind let's change the clock right you know let's start it again right. Um, and so now, of course, they're trapped in a narrative that says we see no signs growth is slowing. And everyone else is looking around going, what in the world are you people looking at? Right. They're destroying their credibility on a daily basis. And in a weird way, I mean, I, I you know, I would, I would point this out that they're also kind of getting what they wanted. Financial the way, conditions like, are tightening. Things are slowing. I mean, you know, it's, it, it's they haven't had to hike rates that we much. Have six and a half percent positive nominal GDP. The headline was negative one and change, but we had positive six and change, okay? The real, big, not real, blah, 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 blah. the number, the real economy, okay? That's not, that's, that's not you know, a depression or a recession, per se. I guess you could, you could define it as being real was negative one and change. If we get another quarter of that, then in, in theory, we've had a, we're in a recession. But I mean, you know, if, if, if the economy nominally is growing at six and a half, I wouldn't call that a bad result. How, I think, how I think, I think you're, just very quickly, I think you're mixing your inflation metrics there, though, because GDP deflator was like five, six. So it would have been if you have minus one point six. I real think you go to Bloomberg and type in uh, type in nominal GDP. It'll say six point three. Oh, well, that, all right. That makes sense. OK, that, that's correct. When you get five percent inflation, if they can thread that needle, I mean, they say they want to, but you get five percent for a couple of years. You solve your corporate debt problem. You solve your pension problem. 
we have a debt crisis, and you solve debt by default or inflate, and inflation is slow motion default. Yeah. So if you like, this gets interesting because you know, uh, I, maybe, I'll, maybe I'll use this to bring this into that point. But um, you know, I we we met almost ten years ago yeah. to this almost ten years ago to the day. Yeah. yeah um, on a paper that I wrote um, that talked about there was a graphic that showed all the ships representing different countries. Uh, and they're sailing through this narrow strait. And on one side of that strait is the waterfall of deflation. On the other side of that strait is the hellfire of inflation. Mm -hmm. And the idea being is that uh, policymakers are trying to sail through the strait and trying to avoid the waterfall of deflation can lead you to the hellfire of inflation. And every policy mistake, that strait gets narrower and narrower. And now it is so narrow because if they get 5% inflation a year, we have the highest corporate debt to GDP, some of the highest uh, government deficits uh, outside of war in history. And you, you get 5% inflation a year, you sail through that straight perfectly. You can cut your debt by a third over five years. Life is good, no problemo. You get, if you begin to get upwards of 8, 10% consistently, what ends up happening is that the, when corporate bonds have to roll, they, currently, they have the highest uh, duration in history right now of about five. But if, if corporate bond yields go back up to where they were just in the mid-2000s, then 30 to 50% of corporate profits will have to go to debt service alone. So if at this point, they are rising, but most of that rise has been based on duration. The ma majority of that's been based on duration, not credit spread, not credit risk. But if you get another pump up of 200, 300 basis points in corporate yields, you have something that is analogous in the corporate world to the arm crisis that led to the mortgage crisis. So at the same time, if you get inflation too low, you've got a whole other set of, set of problems that we've experienced. So they've got to thread this needle. And to this point, if they run too hot to inflation, it runs us right back into a major deflationary crisis and solvency crisis. And you know, by the way, if rates go back up, if corporate bond yields go back up to the where, the where, where they were in the 1970s, 100% of corporate profits go to debt service. Go to debt service. And, and as you stated eloquently before, that that's a very optimistic stance because it's assuming that these companies will be able to roll their debt. I'd like well, to go and say one thing though. That paper that Chris wrote is the best paper you ever put out. I think it's genius. Everyone should go look up and read it. I will say also that the picture, I didn't know that's what it meant. I thought it was, it was pre-Renaissance Catholic Church believing in a flat earth, <laughs> and they're falling off the flat earth. I didn't realize it actually meant that. So, I Well, the what, what you described at that time period is actually, I mean, the way you and I bonded on that was your description of a bull market in fear, right? And people forget that at that point in time, and it was almost exactly 10 years ago to the day, right? It was June 4th, 2020, 2012, that the long dated um, variance contracts peaked in the, the mid 40s, right? So, I mean, just to put this in perspective, 10 years ago today, if you had been making a bet on what the long term volatility in the equity markets was supposed to be, the street was telling you it was somewhere in the neighborhood of 30, 35 to 45% every single day, right? Now, Chris and I both looked at that and were like, if that's true, everybody should just go home, right? Because the whole thing is completely uninvestable. For the next 10 years to have every single day be basically the three days after 9-11 is completely insane. That like, it doesn't make any sense whatsoever. No, the skew know. also, what, what he highlighted, which was even more interesting to me. Well, there was no bid for the upside, right? So again, that was part of the reason, and you were on these trades as well, where it was like, look, you know, you can effectively go long the stock market for free if you're willing to sell the insurance that the market's not gonna fall by 50% over the next two years. Right, like so. So those were the the um, that was the characteristics that existed at that point in time. Today, as we're starting to push, and I mentioned earlier, longer dated variance contracts, etc. One, there's not that, that like they just have never been that liquid again. Right, the institutions largely stepped out of that space. There's just not a lot of demand for the ten year variance contract or even the five year variance contract. The restructuring of the variable annuity space has largely been completed, so that bid is gone. The demand is gone from there. But now we're looking at a situation where the high levels of implied volatility, even though they are not outrageous versus where we are in history, 
are creating conditions where people basically have to decide, I'm going to go shorter end, shorter dated on my options. And I think this is part of what Chris was referring to earlier, because we see it at Simplify, right? I mean, we have to manage our hedges. And if you're running a shorter dated hedge, a shorter tenor option, the decay on that is so rapid that you effectively have to monetize, yeah. right? You're forced to say, okay, we got a four or 5% sell off. We're now going to take those positions off. Right. And we're going to roll into the next position, et cetera. That is constantly releasing the pressure on the dealers from that negative gamma component. Now, we've seen elevated volatility on, on a year to day basis. It's been completely consistent, not at all unusual relative to other periods of negative gamma. So I do think that there are meaningful components associated with the dealer behaviors in the positive gamma versus negative gamma sort of routine. But as you were alluding to before, and I think a lot of people even in the option space tend to miss this dynamic. The cure for um, gamma is high implied vol, right? It's in the denominator. So, you know, ultimately, like we have created a system where people desperately want to hedge. We're all aware of the risks. It's resulting in the cost of hedging being extraordinarily high and people are being forced into shorter stuff. If you're worried about systemic risk, who would you rather have holding the short gamma? Citadel Susquehanna or retail or some tight stop hedge fund? I think I know who the answer is, you know. Well, I, so I, I think it depends, right? So part of when? the, I think it depends because I think part of the dynamic is, is that Citadel and Susquehanna, exactly as you're saying, they're not actually holding it. They're delta hedging. Yes. So there's a systemic risk that exists that Chris is referring to, which is effectively gap risk, jump risk, the fact that the market suddenly become discontinuous, right? That is what caught, that's what scares the hell out of dealers who are yeah. using delta hedging. They step back. They just step out they of the market, and I'm that's not. part of the that's part of the other picture that we have, which is the liquidity in the market just doesn't exist. I mean, you and I were able. I mean, Harley, you and I were able to do trades of size that doesn't just reflect the different asset bases that we were dealing with, but the depth of the markets in vol space in 2011, 2012. As crazy as it sounds, it was so much deeper and so much bigger than it is today. It's pretty scary, actually. It's astonishing. The liquidity's got it. It is astonishing. Yeah. I mean, I wrote a paper in, in 2020 about this issue of liquidity in the S&P, for example, and highlighted that we'd gone from an environment in 2012 where you could do a billion dollar trade and you'd move the S&P a tick. And, and in uh, March 2020, that number had dropped to a million dollars. You would move the S&P a tick. Now we're right back there. Right. I mean, without COVID, we've gotten back down to those levels. And it really is. It feels like that's just a function of there's actually not that much competition for the individual dealers. It's pretty interesting to sort of see these, I think it was January 24th, where you have that, you know, you have a 4% gap down, a 4% gap, like- you know, The next day, yeah, yeah, this is- well, Actually, intraday, yeah, yeah. Actually, the same day. It was just like, boy, I mean, this is- and we, saw, we, we saw this on Tuesday of this week, right? I mean, just to, to date the timing on this. Um, Which does not hit the-, uh, the uh, the realizable, database. Ball. yeah. The, the database <laughs> does not hit realize because of the four yeah. to four, uh, it was zero vol. Yeah, that's right. You have an eight percent intraday move, and it's like zero vol <laughs> on the realized vol print. And, and that's a so. So I actually just ran a calculation on this. If you actually look at effectively the miles traveled, right, and you can't do this through history because we don't have the at least not in the easily available. We don't have the intraday moves going back over long periods of time. We didn't even start to get, I mean, people forget this or so, we didn't even start to get you know, published open, low, high, close data until like 1983 yeah, on the S&P right. 500, right? So I always want to remind people that the actual data sets that we have are vanishingly small in the greater scheme of things, right? So we just don't know that much. But part of what we're actually seeing right now is the gap between the intraday volatility measures and the realized volatility on a close to close basis is among the largest it's ever been in history as well. It's also interesting, like this year, like what has worked this year? I mean, this this would be shocking to people, but like uh, what would be gamma scalping has actually done well as of late. And that concept, you know, to explain to an audience, it's inherently a mean reversionary type of strategy when you're gamma scalping. So in one aspect, you know, where you're, you know, gamma scalping and you're short Vega, you're short Vol, and your gamma scalping, that has actually performed pretty well this year. And I would not necessarily call that a kind of 
long crisis alpha type of no it's a, it's, yeah. it's inherently the same monetization that we're talking about right you're saying okay market is down today i expect it to be up tomorrow yeah right? that's right effectively yeah. what's happening or it's noon and the market is down by 4 p.m i expect it to be flat right so we're seeing this and again for me it comes down to and, and i certainly experienced this at simplify with the products that were actively involved in hedging like we are constantly being forced into shorter dated hedges which means the decay associated with them and the sensitivity, the gamma component to them is much higher than it's been in, in yeah. our uh, you know traditional models. If you're if you're if you're working with long vol, like simply there's like almost you, no gamma. There's yeah, so you're either forced into a shorter dynamic, you're either I mean what what you're gonna have to do to perform is you're either short to a shorter shorter dynamic, you're gonna have to go through other volatility transmission act. Uh, mechanisms, meaning let other asset classes where vol is being Which goes back to some of the things that have worked, right? We've talked about rate vol and FX vol have been areas that have emerged as heroes in the long vol space relative to, to what we're seeing in equities. Yeah, and one of the things that's worked very well um, traditionally as a cost-effective vol hedge is what I would call vol gamma or vol trend. Like like in many ways, you play vol the way, that a, C, the way a CTA or a commodity trend advisor would play uh, commodities, you trade vol in that same capacity. That's something, but that has not performed. It hasn't done badly. It hasn't performed at all this year. Like you, you, you haven't had any. The very fact that gamma skeletons is working, you haven't had any vol gamma to play off of, so uh, or vol trend to play off of. Um, so it's very, it's a very frustrating. Yeah, this is. A, it, I, I mean, I'll, I'll be. We and again, we've talked about this. Like this is by far the hardest market to hedge effectively that I have encountered. Um, and I realize that sounds insane. I would insane. push back and say, it's never different this time. Everyone always thinks whatever happens to them today is the worst, the most, the biggest, the best. It's all happened before. And every single crisis we have, everyone always says this is the worst. And it's never different this time. We have not invented tragedy here, OK? We just want to feel like it's the worst so we feel better. But it's it's really frustrating. It's a uh, very on, frustrating man. environment. I, 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 I've been there long enough to tell you, it's always the same, and it always feels bad when it happens. God, he's smug when his product's working. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> he's he, smug. he does have some bragging rights on yeah, that. But, yeah, but that goes back to the point. It's the it's, it's the, the other asset, asset class, class ball, the transmutation. Which again, ball. Harley, you talked about, it's, right? I mean, you, like this was intentional in your creation of interest rate hedging strategies. Was somebody has to create something that allows people to say, "What if the relationship between rates and equities breaks down?" Right, and so like that was it was a brilliant insight, and I, I will one hundred percent accede to that. Thank you. Well, let, let, let's, let's pull the lens back for a second before the clock runs out. I'm trying to wrestle with right now is usually when the Fed starts to hike for whatever the reason it might be, um, you don't get the flattening until the second to last hike. That's history. Um, maybe it's different this time. It seems. Like, what? How do we reconcile what's going on right now where? The curve is rotating um, almost before the Fed even started hiking. Right. Uh, Not I mean, almost. Absolutely. Yeah. The minute they started indicating that they were going to, the curve began to flatten dramatically. So, I mean, does, does, I mean, does that mean, I mean, I, I guess you would argue, and maybe you're right, we're already in a recession. And, and, the, and the bond market's got this thing pegged that we're in the recession and we're going to flip right now. Um, uh, is that the answer here, that, that we're in a recession? And if that's the case, then stock, it pulled back 20.1% and time to buy them and, and, and bonds, like the curve's going to flatten at two and a half, three, and there you have it. The cycle's already done before, before we even woke up. Or I would push back and say, perhaps the Fed's heavy hand of holding down rates um, has, that's where it's been. And my idea is, I, I mean, I'm at the poker table, I want to turn one more card over, which is what happens when we actually start draining liquidity. Uh, there's a great chart that we've all seen of um, the last decade of the four main central banks pumping in, I don't know, 20-odd trillion dollars and stocks and bonds going up tick for tick with it. Maybe it's cause, maybe it's correlation, whatever. But if they actually drain the pond of a couple trillion bucks, um, theoretically, we should go back down again, stocks and bonds. Um, where are you in that, Mike and, and, and Chris? I would, I would agree. <laughs> I would agree with that thesis. Well, think, Mike, yeah. you wouldn't, because you'd say we're in a recession right now, and therefore bonds and stocks are kind of okay. We've priced it in, and I think bonds. I, I, so, my bias is is that bonds are telling you that that we've hit terminal rate, um, somewhere in the three percent range, on on quote unquote risk free rates. 
I don't think the U.S. economy can handle higher than that. And this goes back to my, you know, uh, argument around the transitory characteristics of inflation. We just don't have the underlying characteristics that we had in the 1970s, where the number of households, the number of individuals that need stuff is expanding dramatically. We're seeing the exact opposite, in fact. We're seeing household formation start to move in reverse, as you would expect, with higher household prices. And suddenly people are saying, you know, millennials who lived with their, par with their parents. And as much as this is frustrating to people to hear, when you have 27% of your population living with their parents until they're 30 years old, they're not moving out. Many of those people will become Italians. They will live with their parents forever, right? And that's a solution. It is a way that society deals with things like much you higher prices. You make it me too in Italy, you know, for that. What's that? You make it me too in Italy. Well, I, no, I, I've called this for years. And I mean, you can go back and you can listen to things that I talked about 10 years ago, right? The Italianization of America is absolutely happening. Geographic mobility has collapsed. Population growth has collapsed. Household formation has collapsed on a relative basis. People are living with their parents longer and longer and longer. Why? Because the single greatest resource that a parent can offer is one, paying for your college education, and two, giving you free housing. Right? And the minute you have that, you've got extraordinary flexibility, which is why places like Italy can handle 30% unemployment rates. We, we even had our own Mussolini. We even had our own Mussolini, and Buckle it's a little there. terrifying. Like, <laughs> Very <are>. quiet. <laughs> well, we we unfortunately, the audience. yeah. Well, this is a great reminder of how much Mussolini was below. He, so, he was, he was, yeah. And, and until he was put on a meat hook, right? Yes. So it, you know, the the underlying component that I would just toss out from here is <laughs> this is why we love getting together and talking. Like Harley started this out today. So what the hell are we going to talk about? And the question is, how do we stop talking? So <laughs> I'm going to have to actually draw the limit here. Chris, this was absolutely fantastic. I was was love having you in. I wish we had a chance to talk more about you know the Dragon portfolio and some of the stuff you're doing uh, over talk about that <laughs> at, at Artemis, but we're going to have to do this again soon. We'll do it again, right? yeah. Um, what I love what I love about these talks is that there's like no preparation whatsoever. We have no, no. idea. But this they is tell. Yeah, well, yeah, it's unfortunate. The unprofessional nature of the things we produce is very, very clear. But it is actually like this is what happens when we sit down and just talk casually. It's a real con yeah, yeah, it's, it's like real a real conversation. conversation. Yeah. So anyway, Chris, thank you so much for joining us. This is yeah. really awesome. Harley, awesome. I'm glad you were able to be here as well. And thank you to EQD for having their event here in the wind in Las Vegas. Yeah.